Welcome, I'm Daniel Scrivener, and this is Outliers, where every week I sit down with an entrepreneur, investor, or iconoclast to dissect what they've mastered and how they see the world, digging deep to find the ideas, patterns, and perspectives that can help us all become better entrepreneurs, investors, and leaders. And today we're lucky to have Rennick Pally on the show for one of our first investor interviews. Rennick is the managing partner and chief investment officer at Stratos Technologies. Since founding Stratos in 2016, Rennick has led over $250 million in venture debt financing for companies like Dave, Tala, Resi, and ClearBank. Before founding Stratos, Rennick worked as a research associate at Sanders Capital, the $40 billion global equity manager founded by Louis Sanders, formerly chairman and CEO of Alliance Bernstein. Rennick holds a Bachelor's of Science in Applied Mathematics, as well as Mechanical Engineering. And he also has a master's in quantitative finance from MIT. This episode is the first half of my conversation with Rennick, with the second half coming later this week. In this episode, we explore the world of venture debt investing, why most private companies are under levered, what Rennick learned from Lewis Sanders at Sanders Capital, and so much more. Rennick is one of the sharpest investment minds I've ever come across, so it's a real treat and you are not going to want to miss this episode. As always, for links to everything discussed, as well as show notes and the full transcript of our conversation, visit outliers.fm. And finally, here's the bit where I remind you that nothing we discuss should be considered investment or financial advice. This conversation is for informational and hopefully entertainment purposes only. Please do your own research and come to your own conclusions or speak to your financial advisor before putting a dollar into anything we discuss. And now let's jump in. Rennick, I am so excited to have you on the podcast. Honestly, from the moment I met you, I've wanted to have a conversation like this with you. So thank you so much for your time and thanks for coming on Outliers. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited too. Grateful to be here. To set up a little bit of context and I guess just to give everyone a little bit of a preview, we're going to spend a bunch of time today talking about Stratos Technologies, which is the fund that you've been building and what you've done so far there and where you're headed. We're also going to talk a lot about nerd out on investment psychology and philosophy. But what I want to do is just give everyone a little bit of a background on who you are and what you did previous to Stratos. So where I wanted to start was I'm always fascinated when I talk to other investors to just get a sense for what made them interested in investing to begin with. So do you mind fleshing that out a little bit? Then we can talk about some of your background. I started my career in engineering, aerospace engineering. And you know there was something that occurred to me while I was doing that. And I was in my early 20s at the time. And it was that the design of aircraft and aerospace generally is determined by physics. And physics don't really change. And that was interesting because it meant to me that the ability for the industry and the designs themselves to change was limited by physics. And you could only get so perfect for operating an aircraft within the boundaries of our atmosphere and even beyond it, which isn't to say that we've already gotten there by any means. And obviously, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in aerospace today, but it made me wonder was there somewhere else that I could go that was going to have a little bit of a changing landscape, a field that was sort of changing underneath you as things happened. And it made me look into investing because that had always been an area that seemed to me was driven by people and people are emotional creatures. And as a result of that, they sort of do things that may not be rational. And, you know, in comparison to physics, everything is perfectly rational and deterministic. So I started going in that direction and then found it to be very interesting and the depth to pretty much anything that you could look at and try and understand and investing ended up getting to a point where there was math that could define it, but then there was also psychology and then philosophy on top of that. And so To me, that seemed like an area that had sufficient depth that was going to keep me interested for a really long time. I love that part of your background is clearly so engineering and physics heavy, you know, and I'm curious when you think about investing, how much of that to you is hard science versus something that's more like art? And how do you think about that balance? I think it's both blended together and the table stakes are the math components. So it has to make sense that a business is going to, at some point, 
generate cash flows that are going to be discounted back to today and therefore that will create that value today uh, that market cap of that business or however you're looking at that particular asset but at the same time the way in which those cash flows are generated and when they actually occur is more of the art component but then there's the philosophy component which is okay well how is the rest of the world going to value those cash flows in the context of everything else that's going on and how much of that actually has to be rooted in reality in something that actually ends up happening and how much of it is just based upon people's perception of what is likely to happen and it leads me to think about what's going on in the market today which is you know a lot of investors who have a particular viewpoint and framework for understanding value are sort of perplexed by what's going on in the market. And maybe we should talk about that a little bit more later, but things kind of go through phases in terms of how people think about investments. And if you were to look at, let's say, you know, the way that U.S. equities were valued over the last 10 or 20 years, and you said, how much of a company's valuation at one point times zero was actually justified by what occurred by T plus five years? And you probably would find that there was a huge amount of noise and error there. But at time zero, that is still what the company was being valued at by the market. You could transact at that price. And so it leads me to say that so much of that, you know, you could have justified what you were paying on that day based on math. But ultimately, it ended up being something much closer to philosophy in that you would ask, what was it that was driving me to decide that? And there was no math that could have justified it in retrospect. I love that. And, you know, part of how I've been thinking about that, and we'll definitely put a pin in this and come back to it, but I think how people think about time. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think value investors are very much in the moment. They expect all valuations to be in lockstep with where the business is in that moment. And I think growth investors and particularly kind of the newest generation of growth investors, I think their minds tend to think directionally. I think because of that, we have very different views of the world. We talked about a little bit of that background. I'd love to talk about what you did right before starting Stratos, which was you spent a bit of time at Sanders Capital, which I know is much broader than what you're focused on now. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how that influenced how you approached Stratos? I was incredibly fortunate to get that job. I was hired by Lou Sanders, who was the CEO and chairman of Alliance Bernstein and one of the early guys at Sanford Bernstein. And so he had sort of developed what we think of today as modern equity research, where you're writing 100-page research reports, and it's very in-depth, fundamental research. And so he hired me out of grad school, and I got to learn how to invest directly from him and the rest of the people on the team. And it gave me a great opportunity to look at the world from a 30,000-foot view. So I got to look at a lot of different industries, a lot of different countries that were engaged in various forms of industry and then companies themselves within those verticals. And it gave me the chance to understand what one of the preeminent value investors thought about the world, particularly in terms of his Lou's investment framework and how he thought about computing expected returns and how to really do good research. But then also it gave me a sense for where the world was going by having seen so many different verticals. And it gave me the chance to decide where I wanted to really focus from there. And, you know, I looked at the world and thought we're in a state of low secular growth. That's probably going to be the case for a long time. I'm not really one for making macro bets, but I'll guess that based on the data we have available, that's likely to continue to be the case. And that a lot of the growth in the world or the most interesting things happening and value being created was coming out of the tech world. So I thought, okay, I, I want to look at that. I want to really make a bet and get involved in that space. And on top of that, there seemed like the tide was going out in public markets investing. The, the simple fact is that you have a benchmark that you're compared to, and that benchmark costs basically asymptotically close to zero. 
to invest in. And so in order to justify your existence as a public markets investor, you have to beat it. And we started looking at private deals together and that was really our start to begin investing in the private markets and in tech. And I have to ask just two somewhat nerdy questions about your time at Sanders Capital. And that is, you know, I'd be curious if you can share maybe one or two investments or companies that you found particularly interesting and just kind of just so we get a sense for maybe what you were looking at when you were there. And then the second one is something that when I think about my own career in the design space, kind of in the initial portion of my career, I was lucky enough to work at Apple early on, which in my mind was very much like a boot camp. Like it taught me a lot of good discipline and how to avoid some of the pitfalls of the creative process. And it seems to me that, you know, you having this experience at Sanders Capital likely maybe served a similar role. You talked about the 100 page investment memo. Were there other things you learned from a money management or trade discipline perspective while you were there? Probably the best thing I can say about what I learned at Sanders is there are things that I'm encountering today as someone who runs a business, but also as an investor that I look back and think about Sanders and think, oh, now I understand why he did things that way or why he was thinking about it. So there were things that weren't obvious to me given my experience or just the amount of responsibility I had when I was there that were actually incredibly thoughtful and I would say simple, but you could have only learned or appreciated once you yourself were managing a portfolio or running a business. And so I think that goes to say a lot about Lou having been around the block many times and being really, really good at what he does. In terms of what I got from it, so there wasn't really like a training program at Sanders. You know, I just kind of got there and just sat in the seat. That was it. It was really working with Lou and the rest of the team directly. And I remember the first time I ever did it, we called them research reviews. So we would look at a company and I would spend a couple of weeks understanding as much about it as I was able to and you know was available in the public markets and talking to management and talking to experts and oftentimes going to the actual company and checking out their plant equipment and the like and understanding competitors and you know all of that stuff that's common in, in equity research. And then I'd build a model that articulated my view of the future for that business. And then I would sit down with Lou and the co-CIO, John, and walk them through what I thought was going to happen and my analysis of where the company was and how they got there and where they were going. And I remember the first time it was a bloodbath. It was terrible because the number of companies that those guys have seen in their career is just staggering. That was painful, but that was a great way to learn. That was like, you know, trial by fire. That was the best way for me to figure out how those guys thought. And so then fast forward a few years after having been there, I would anticipate what they would be thinking when I was thinking about a business and trying to put things together. And so that ended up being the basis or the foundation of then my investment philosophy as I had continued at Sanders and brought ideas to them. But then also after I'd left and investing Stratos, investing my personal account, et cetera. To answer your question about what were some of the things that I did there, well, one that's particularly timely right now was a short position that we had was not my idea, but it was the most perfect short. It was an industry in secular decline that was the high cost producer. You know, if you had done the research and you determined what the cost curve was for global production, they were surely just uneconomical to produce their commodity at the prices they were producing it on that day. And in addition to that, in a very highly levered, high fixed cost industry, it was just perfect short. And so we had the short position and it was on for a year. And then Donald Trump got elected and he basically said, hey, all of the imports that are quote unquote dumping this commodity was uncoated free sheet paper, eight and a half by 11 printer paper that, you know, obviously people are using a lot less of. You guys can't do that anymore. We're going to slap a hundred dollars tariff on top of it. And so then the stock popped and it had nothing to do with the financials or the fundamentals. The probability distribution of outcomes in any investment is one of the most important things to think about that I think is not thought of because outcomes are probabilistic. And oftentimes people will think that one outcome describes the full potential range 
well, but of course it doesn't. You can't rerun the future a million times to understand what the true probability distribution is. But if you're thinking about shorting, the best you can do is you can double your money by the stock going to zero, or you could potentially be liable for 10x your investment. I mean, GameStop is the perfect example, especially if you're levered, if you have options or something else with inherent leverage. Thinking about that statement in the context of value and growth, it's sort of the same thing. If you're buying a stock that is cheap, and it's cheap because you know the market has some anxiety about its future earnings potential, and let's say it's down 50% from the 52-week high. Well, the best you can possibly do is maybe double your money. That sounds like a lot. It is. I'm not going to downplay a double. But think about, you have to be right to get that 2x. And we'll hold aside whether it's easier or harder to be right in value versus growth. But now let's look at growth. If you're right in a growth investment, you can make 10x, you can make 100x. People would say, well, that's so uncommon you know, to see a business that grows that way. And that might be true. I think that it's becoming more common today than it had been. And you know, I think that's a whole other discussion. But think about how less frequently you need to be right to offset those times when maybe you're not right, when you are correct in a company that has the potential to scale significantly, you could make one bet. And that's basically venture right there, or part of a large aspect of the venture mentality is that. Whereas in value, you're looking for something that is the cigar butt, so to speak, which is something that we should talk about. But I also don't really like the growth versus value characterization. It's what's common today. But I think every stock that has future growth can be value. And every stock that is value can also be growth. They go together, but I guess it's just something people like to think in headlines. So that's the headline value versus growth. Well, and people like to think in terms of black versus white or one side versus the other. They like to take something and split it into two opposing sides. I think there's also a tremendous amount of opportunity that lies at the intersection of value and growth, where you have a growth investment that if you are right about your model of the future, it is extremely cheap today. You know, And it could be cheap on a relative basis. It could be cheap on an absolute basis. But I see some of those opportunities, and I feel like that just debunks the whole myth of one side versus the other pretty squarely. I mean, that's exactly it. Its value is in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. And it's not a statistical metric of, is this 15 times earnings or below, which is kind of like the classic statistical value threshold for what's cheap and what's not. But I think what you just said, is my model of the world accurate for what's going to happen here? I think there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the world today that is making people reevaluate what model to use to try and determine that. It comes down to one piece of math that explains something that's a lot bigger, but to simplify it, it's what is my transition matrix of growth? Which is to say, like, how quickly does the growth of a company decay over time? So if you were to look at every business pre-FANG, let's say, in the history of the world, it would generally look the same. You couldn't expect a company to compound at 30% per year for 10 years or 20 years or a higher compounded number than that because it just wasn't possible. You were dealing with, they are the limitations that are prevalent in the physical world and every business existed in the physical world. Okay, now you've got FANG, Facebook, Apple's kind of in the middle, but Facebook, Google are the two prototypical examples of this where you have a business that has zero marginal cost and unlimited scale until you saturated every person on earth. And then you've got to figure out the next thing to do. But before that, realistically, there was really no business other than maybe, I don't know, Coca-Cola that could serve every human on earth. And so they would just hit these walls and so they would stop growing. And then management would go and do something stupid to try and juice the stock or whatever. And that's why you couldn't ascribe the same kind of valuation multiple to those businesses then as you can now. And I'm not saying that, oh, well, the sky's the limit. You could pay anything. That's not true. But if you look at a company and you say, I think this thing's going to compound for 50% per year for 10 years, you're looking at an exponential curve that's very hard to overpay for. 
Now, again, this is like blasphemy in the church of value that I'd even say something like that, especially given that I started my career as a value investor. And you have to find some way to mathematically rationalize that. I don't think that you can just pay any price and hope that it works out. And we can talk about my approach for doing that, but I think it's a really interesting world we're entering. And I think there are going to be more and more businesses that look like that. I couldn't agree more. I love that this goes back and mimics the beginning of your career of kind of being in a space that what you could do is limited by the physical environment, by the laws of physics and wanting to do something else. But what I also love is, you know, I think my favorite types of investors are people like you that are fundamentally growth investors, meaning that they're looking at businesses that are disrupting something that's happening in the world, are going into industries that haven't been touched in a long time, or are just building something that inherently has massive, massive scale, but they don't just YOLO it into the stock and buy it any multiple. They're doing this really difficult thing, which is in their mind, they're both balancing this kind of extreme sense of optimism and an idea about how this scaling can happen over time, while at the same time, knowing that a business is only worth so much and you have to kind of keep both of those in mind because I feel like they're both good tethers to just keep you in the world of reality. I'd love to transition a little bit and talk about Stratos to set up a little bit of your background. We've talked a little bit about some of the philosophies that shape it. Can you just start by, I guess, sharing the initial idea or kind of the initial insight that led to Stratos and describe a little bit about what that, how that started out as? We were seeing opportunities in the private market that generated mid-teens current cash yield. And looking at those opportunities, they were typically debt deals, and comparing it to the expected return of a lot of opportunities in the public markets, both debt and equity, and thinking, what kind of risks would I have to take to earn 13% current yield in the public market if it even existed? And something with a QCIP. Like, and I was at the time looking at Puerto Rican sovereign debt and thought, hmm, which bet do I like more? I like these things we're seeing in the tech space all day. And there's no volatility and it has a finite term and it's monthly cash pay. This is more attractive. That was kind of juxtaposed with thinking, you know, what I had said before about tech being interesting and private markets being interesting, but thinking venture is really competitive. Venture is really competitive because only a small number of people can get into any given deal, a small number of funds or investors. And it's really hard to even see the best deals. And there's a lot of venture funds. And so how do you differentiate? It's not like the public markets where you can just go out and participate in the market at that price. This was in 2014. So I guess by that measure, venture's gotten a lot more competitive. Just to underscore a few things there, you're investing in basically venture capital backed businesses, but you're investing on the debt side. Correct. It's a good question because I think a lot of people's immediate reaction to that would be, wow, that sounds kind of risky. And maybe someone who was more cynical would say, so you're basically taking venture equity risk for capped upside. To go back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago in terms of what the probability distribution of returns is for any given investment. But I think that what we were able to figure out was how you could structure the deals in such a way where you weren't actually taking venture risk. You're actually exposing yourself directly to the risk of the underlying assets, the collateral that you are lending against. Some of those structures were not really a new thing. It's kind of taking a book out of securitization finance and structured credit of various kinds. But I think we were pretty early in applying it to venture. And so what that ended up doing for us is it started to get us deal flow that we didn't really deserve, <laughs> to be honest, because there weren't a lot of other people doing what we were doing. And there were a number of companies now that are unicorns that needed that kind of financing early on. And so fast forward to where we are today, we're still doing that. We're still providing credit facilities and we have a dedicated fund for that. And we're trying to always be on the limit of how can we creatively do this and provide this form of capital that's non-equity capital that's scalable to help our underlying portfolio companies scale in a way that is more equity efficient. And the other thing that's really important about that is there's a lot of reflexivity in venture and tech based on what we were talking about a few minutes ago. If you see a company that's scaling and it looks like it's really 
capturing a market, even if it's early on, you're going to be able to raise a lot of money from great investors, which ends up creating this reflexivity because then what happens? If you can raise money at a good valuation, you can then get great talent. And then when you get great talent, people start to know about you. When people start to know about you, you the clients come to you. Oh, I heard about you or, oh, you look legitimate. You have these great venture investors, you know, even more so. So the flywheel starts to drive itself. And so then taking a step back and asking, how do you get there? It's how do you set up the capital structure from day one to enable that? And, you know, some people might say, okay, well, the thing to do is just raise equity, use equity to finance your early assets and go from there. And sometimes that's the right answer. But other times the right answer is, well, actually, you can use some other form of financing that isn't linked to the equity or is less directly linked to the equity than a safe note or a preferred equity investment that can help drive that scale earlier on in the life cycle of the company, which then drives this reflexivity that we were just talking about. I just want to pause really quickly and define or kind of talk about that term reflexivity. And I'll just start first. But the reason I wanted to pause is I've been geeking out on that recently over the last couple of months. And the book that I found that I ended up reading is George Soros, The Alchemy of Finance, which is all about it. Is that how you found it? I guess any thoughts to share about reflexivity as a principle? That is definitely a, something that I've stolen fully from George Soros, but used in a different context. His was talking about how markets behave and people follow other people and look at one outcome as something that is likely to predict future outcomes in an autocorrelated way and that they move in the same direction. I'm using it in the sense of venture, as I just described, where a company that has a lot of momentum is able to reinforce its momentum by the fact that it has the momentum in and of itself. And it seems like a core, I mean, just as you were saying that, I just suddenly had this aha moment that it seems like reflexivity is really built into the idea of growth investing, you know, where it is rather than everything being completely rational. And maybe just to stop there for a second, rewind a second. What I found so interesting about reflexivity is it is just a really simple but powerful philosophical concept to try to answer when you look at something in the world and you try to dig into the underlying facts, but they don't completely support what this thing is trading at or how it's being viewed the world, a lot of times reflexivity is at play. And it's just this idea that if we were to take an investing example, yes, the fundamentals of a business drive the outcome. But as we see all over the place in the market today, whether it's a SPAC or it's a recent IPO or it's Airbnb being worth, you know, a hundred plus billion dollars, there's reflexivity in play. Am I getting that right? And is reflexivity kind of a mental tool in your toolkit as you think about growth investing? It absolutely is. I think it's something that is easy to overweight but I think it's really important to be aware of. And I've seen it happen many times where a company has a valuation that's nearly impossible to justify at the early stage, but then it goes on and justifies it in your face. And I think if you passed, but it comes back again to probability distribution of outcomes. Let's assume you have a portfolio and you have 10 companies in it. And those 10 companies all are at the very early stage of having a marketplace flywheel where they're creating value by making a market for customers and suppliers of various kinds. And you see that the value proposition on both sides is really strong. It's just happening. It's like a tadpole. It's not really there yet, but it's just starting. How much is that worth? Well, it's really hard to say because do you know it's going to actually succeed? No. There's a lot of execution risk. You know, The market could go away and could become irrelevant by the time it can really get to scale. But if you make that bet 10 times out of 10, the times that it works out are going to pay you back tenfold on that fund. And so you have to make that bet because of that. And so it's the reflexivity that drives it from that point. And you have to see it happening right at the start. Otherwise, it's really hard to catch it from there. What's I think powerful about reflexivity and why I think it relates a lot to this notion or philosophy of growth investing is when reflexivity is at play, meaning you're looking at a company and its valuation's insane. It's detached from the underlying fundamentals in the business. If you're taking a growth lens to it, you're not going to necessarily say no to investing because you know that you can, I guess, back into a little bit of why is it valued at that? What does that mean for future valuations? It's almost like you've driven a wedge in between fundamentals and value and that can be supported over time. And then as an value investor, 
invest, you're going to look at that and you're going to think, oh, that's really expensive. And you're not going to invest and you're never going to have another point to enter because that gap's likely to always exist. One thing I want to just ask as a follow-up question to the kind of first fund you guys had is, did you find that you had to, when entrepreneurs would come to you and you would be talking about providing them with kind of debt venture capital, were there people that were scratching their heads thinking, well, I've never thought about taking debt before? Like how much did you have to help teach people about the role that debt can play in their business in lieu of equity? It varied by the company. And one thing that we really learned was to make sure that we were partnering with founders who really got that. Because if they didn't, it meant that the value of the relationship and what we could ultimately create together was more limited. And so it was something that we were in the process of doing, actually. We have a blog post series that's about to come out that really talks about all of these things to help tell that story on a broader scale. I think the idea of trying to save dilution is something that people generally understand. I think it's the reflexivity aspect of it that I think could be told in a way that resonates more with founders. Because I think they get it, you know, when they get a term sheet from a top tier VC, they get what that means. It's the same money, but it's the signaling to the market and the rest of the things that it drives. And so, well, what if they can when it's time to go raise a series A or B or C, they can be two or three X further ahead in terms of where they are. Well, what kind of reflexivity does that create? And so that's one of the things that I think is I'm most excited to tell and also to figure out at scale how we can apply it to a number of different industries, which we've already begun to do. I'd be happy to talk about that. I want to talk a little bit about capital structure. And you said a statement to me that literally the moment you finished saying it, it's just been echoing in my mind ever since. And it's a really simple, short statement, but I think it's really profound. And it's just that venture back tech is under levered. Can you talk a little bit about kind of capital structure and how to think about private leverage versus public leverage and that opportunity? I think you have to start with the prototypical venture backed company today and ask yourself, what does capital structure look like? It's SaaS. B2B SaaS is the prototypical venture-backed business. And it's almost all equity. Sometimes they'll raise some venture debt from SVB or something like that. But for the most part, it's all equity. But you can look at LBO SaaS businesses that have been bought by private equity firms or being acquired or, or whatever, and they hold a lot of debt. And I'm not necessarily saying that levering up in that way is the right thing to do. That's not what I'm trying to say here at all. What I'm trying to say is that even a business that doesn't generate profits has assets that are highly leverageable. And at the most basic level, it's their customers. And those customers produce contracts, but it's really the customers that is the atomic unit and then you build out from there. And so if you have customers, you get contracts. If you get contracts, you have receivables. If you have receivables, then you have cash flow that you can leverage. And so, you know, there's a question of, well, what are the true unit economics of a business? And that really is like the whole foundation, in my opinion, of how you think about businesses today and growth businesses and how do you see something that maybe on the PL today doesn't generate profits but has tremendous future earnings potential. It's what is the atomic unit in terms of unit economics, customer level unit economics, and if the company produces enough of those, where is it in the future? But to digress on that point and talk about capital structure, I think that there are a couple of factors that drive these businesses being under levered. A lot of it has to do with investor psychology, which is there is a statistical truth about what will occur with an investment, whether it's equity or debt or anything else. And then there's the perception of what is likely to occur. And oftentimes those things can diverge when the world is moving quickly or where things have changed from what would have been expected in the past. And so I think that is an example of venture-backed businesses where there's an expectation that a lot will fail. There's still fear about the prior tech bubble in the early 2000s. And there's also just, in some cases, a lack of understanding around what unit economics really mean for a business. 
there is just not as much interest in lending to venture backed businesses in ways other than one where someone will come in and say, okay, you just raised $10 million of equity. I'll give you 3 million of debt. And the reality is that these businesses do stand on their own. And I'd like to make the point that it's probably the case that a higher percentage of venture backed businesses will have some positive outcome than if you were to take 20 years of data and identify you know, how many of them were zeros. I think it's different now. I think it's different now because it takes a lot less money to start a business and you can generate profits or at least positive cash flow way earlier on in the life cycle of the business. And so when you have cash flow, even if you don't have profits, you have a lot more optionality around what you do, where you take the business and how you spend those cash flows to either grow or if you realize that you're not creating value, you can do other things. Whereas if you're not generating any cash flow or any revenue or any gross profits, you're entirely dependent on your investors to decide your fate. And I think, especially in the past, the venture market didn't look the way that it does today, where every fund raises another fund before they're even done investing the last one. And there's a huge incentive to just deploy dollars because a 2% management fee, and now in some cases, even more than that, is a great way to make a lot of money if you can raise enough capital. I think there are a lot of factors at play. I think that it will change. I think it's going to change not because of enterprise SaaS businesses really wanting debt, although there are some, Alex Danko wrote a piece about that recently. There's also some interesting venture-backed businesses going after lending to SaaS businesses. But I actually think it's going to be the other businesses that require more creative capital structures. And that's kind of along the lines of Benedict Evans put out a piece a couple of years ago called The End of the Beginning basically saying that we've done a lot of the things that are software only. And that isn't to say that there won't be a lot more great software businesses, but there is a huge untapped world out there that exists in the physical world that needs software. And it needs a hybrid of venture software and then some either physical, financial, or other form of capital to scale up. And so those businesses are going to require things other than just pure equity. And there's going to be a lot of amazing companies that we see over the next 10, 20, 30 years that have that model. And they're all going to need some other form of capital. And so figuring out how to do that and how to structure it in the right way is something that I'm really interested in. And it brings me to say, we've already been this and we're continuing to invest our internal capital into being a life cycle investor, meaning that we come in early at the seed stage sometimes, depending on what the business is, invest in the debt, also provide equity, and then stick around with the business as it grows. So that doesn't mean we're leading every round by any means, but it means we're participating. And it means we're figuring out as the business scales, what the best capital structure looks like. And then we have the tools to actually implement it because we have the credit fund and we have our equity funds. And I think that's unique. My view is that there's going to be lots of incredible businesses in our lifetimes that need a solution like that. I think it's really interesting and I really like being able to participate on both sides and wear a different hat depending on what deal we're looking at. And that was why I was so excited to have you on and why I've been fascinated by what you're doing at Stratos, because I think that you are pioneers in a space that I think if we were to jump forward five, 10 years in the future, I think every founder, every entrepreneur is not just going to think, let me go out and raise equity you know, from the typical venture capital investors. They're going to say, okay, to grow this business or to achieve these milestones, I'm going to need capital. Here's a few different options. And they're going to be able to think about that in a more nuanced way. And they're going to be able to partner with someone like Stratos throughout the life cycle of a company. And I think that's for me was kind of the aha moment is I know know plenty of entrepreneurs that have raised one round, multiple rounds. I mean, you would think from the outside looking in, okay, you've raised a seed round. Cool. You just like rinse and repeat and you're going to go raise your A. No, it is. You're literally starting back from square one. You're talking to different investors. You've got a different pitch. These people aren't likely, haven't been following along. And so someone like Stratos to be able as an entrepreneur to partner throughout the life cycle of a business, this seems really fascinating and really different. I think making things difficult for myself is something that ends up driving ultimately something that's 
unique and innovative by looking at it from a different perspective and thinking, well, how can I do this in a way that's unique and true to my objectives as someone who likes to invest, but also be involved in these companies in a range of ways, whether it's just by sitting on the board or being close to the founder or even advising in a more hands-on way. There's a lot of ways to be able to work with companies these days. I want to ask two follow-up questions, then we can kind of jump over to just investing philosophy and psychology a bit more. And that was, you had one stat you shared with me kind of ahead of this interview, which was around just this notion that if you look at private companies, or again, we're talking about kind of venture capital-backed companies and how little debt they utilize, and then you try to look at some sort of similar in the public market, so look at something like the Russell 2K, and you see very different stats there. Can you just share that for anyone that's like, okay, I'm halfway there? there, but I don't really know, or I can't see as clearly the difference between a public back company and how they use debt and a private company and how they use debt. Can you draw out that example for us? I was just doing an analysis a few months ago to try and answer this question to say, how big is that market? How do you compare private to public to try and either confirm or deny this hypothesis I had about tech being under levered? just based on my anecdotal experience. And so I looked at the closest proxy to what you could say are growth companies, but in the public markets. And this by no means is a perfect analysis because you could argue that only the least interesting companies are public and the most interesting ones stay private. And you know maybe that's going to change now with SPACs, which I'd love to talk to you about at some point. But basically the total debt to market cap in the, the Russell 2000s is about 25 to 30% debt to market cap. Now, you could argue maybe it should be debt to equity, but I think market cap is a better comparison because then if you start to look at venture and you look at all the venture rounds that are raised and how much money is invested in those rounds, series seed, A, B, C, D, et cetera, that's pretty much the best data we've got on venture in aggregate. Now, we could there are a couple of other data providers that have estimates around valuation, but just using that and making assumptions then around what the amount of dilution is that companies take in each round, then you can start to assume what the market cap of those businesses are. And then you can look at, okay, well, how much debt is being deployed in this market? And it's not even close to 25% or 30% of market cap. It's significantly lower than that. It's low single digits based on my analysis. And even if you look at SVB's venture debt balance sheet, it's a drop in the bucket. It's a couple billion dollars, if I remember correctly. It's an interesting research conclusion. For me, it's definitely clarifying. Do you have a sense for any condensed thoughts about why that's the case and what you think will be the impetus that will tip that and change that kind of narrative? I think it comes down to what is the norm? What are the existing stakeholders in the industry saying is the norm? And who are the players who would be providing the debt? And I think, you know, the norm is you raise equity and instead of raising debt, you raise another round at a higher valuation that has some dilution, but maybe you get to the point where you can raise money at such a high valuation that the dilution is negligible. People haven't really started to use non-equity financing in that way. I also think that the types of investors who do debt typically don't think of the world in the way that is required to really understand the value that these companies have. And so that makes it harder. It's hard to do debt investments in a space where you could very easily wind up taking equity risk for debt upside. And it's hard to know because unless you really are very nuanced with the structures and really understand what you're doing, because otherwise, even if it worked out in your favor, it could have played out a thousand different ways in that probability distribution and it wouldn't have worked. I think it has its challenges, but I think people will figure it out and it will end up becoming a much more popular space. And I know people can go to your website, stratoslp.com, to learn more about the fund and be able to see some of the companies that you've worked with. But can you just share some of the names of the companies you've partnered with on the debt side so far? Probably the best case study to use is our investment with Resi. So they're a YC company from 2017. I think very highly of the team. I actually met them from before they were even in YC, before they'd even started the company. And I like that because I've seen the arc of their business. 
we started out as a credit investor. We provided an off balance sheet facility to finance sort of novel assets that they have, which are lease receivables. And I've watched the business evolve over time、uh, in a way where they've really developed a very interesting moat for themselves. And they used our facility, the fact that they had a balance sheet, to help build that. And then as I've watched them evolve further, We created the opportunity together between us and the company to invest in the equity advantageous valuation. So we weren't equity investors, but we decided to become equity investors because of what we've seen from our involvement on the debt side. And it was an insider round, which you know was kind of points to the fact that we're getting this deal flow that we wouldn't otherwise. And also as a lender, you know, you're on a monthly reporting schedule generally between the company and, and us. So. You get to know these companies really well, and I have always kind of been a high conviction investor, so I like doing it that way. But I'm super excited for where the business is going, and、um, we'll see what future investments we make with them. But you know, there were a couple of periods actually last year during COVID where Resi wanted to go out and do lease deals, and they needed our capital to finance them. And it was a time where they were basically buying multifamily residential leases in Manhattan. When the headlines were atrocious, it was just the worst time to be in multifamily real estate in Manhattan in a hundred years, probably more than that. The blood was on the streets. If I've ever seen blood being on the streets in a well understood institutional asset class, it was then. And you know, the company came to us and told us the opportunity, and we looked at the situation, we looked at the data that we had, we looked at the opportunities they were getting, and we said, okay, we'll fund this deal. Obviously, the price was right for us. But we ended up basically bottom ticking the market in multifamily leases, which was feels good to say in retrospect. But more importantly, it helped the business really take the next step forward because they used our capital, our facility, to go out and do deals that now have become the track record that they're using to sell, doing a similar thing with institutional landlords today. Sort of, let's call it post. The worst period of COVID, when when people were most scared and landlords thought they weren't going to generate any rent income and they were going to lose their properties, and so they were doing these incredible deals. So, it set up the business to do really great stuff, and now investing in it as a result of that is a great way to get exposure to some of the value that we helped create. You said it exactly, but just to pare it back, you know, they used your capital to expand their opportunity set. You know, that they could go after and unlock a whole new opportunity set. They also, because they were high conviction and they had built conviction with you, they got capital at a time where I would imagine it would be pretty hard to go out to a new partner and say, "Hey, this market looks atrocious, but we think that there's an opportunity here, and <laughs> would you give us some capital to go and pursue that?" Most investors, I don't think, would say yes to that. So I think it's a great example from that angle as well, too. It wasn't just based on our trust of the company. I have to say, you know, it was based on our research and looking at data and understanding where the market was at that time, and just basically classic value stuff. Putting that hat on and saying, how much further does the market have to fall before we don't make money? Okay, so it it had already fallen thirty percent, and now we're thinking, okay, is it going to fall another thirty? Well, what has to happen for that to occur? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So that was an interesting one. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to listen to part two of my conversation with Rinnick Pally in episode twenty, which will come out later this week. In that episode, we zoom way out to discuss everything from the recent boom in SPACs and why Rinnick and Stratos might launch one, to why Rinnick is fascinated by the DeFi space and new crypto protocols like Compound. If you like this episode, subscribe to Outliers and be the first to hear about new episodes. You can do that on any podcast platform. If you really like this conversation, please give us a quick review, even just a star rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And join our free weekly newsletter where we share the best of what we're learning and reading each week at the bottom of the homepage of Outliers.fm. Thank you so much.